Welcome to my video series, Audio Tips and Tricks. Over the years, I've discovered inexpensive ways to improve the performance of my audio system and enhance my music listening experience. I hope some of these tips and tricks will help you do the same. I recently stumbled upon a dual turntable at a local thrift store that I volunteer with. It didn't look like a typical 1970s dual automatic turntable. My task was to make sure it was working properly before putting it up for sale. At 33 RPM, its speed wandered up and down even after playing records for several hours. Turning the power on and off seemed to help restore speed accuracy, but only for a little while. What surprised me was how good this vintage unit sounded when it was playing properly. After playing a track from a record on this turntable, with its Ortofon OMB20 cartridge, I played the same track on my VPI Classic 3 turntable with its HANA EL cartridge, which is several orders of magnitude more expensive. Well, the sound wasn't several orders of magnitude better. To my ears, there is slightly more air and transparency in the sonic presentation with the VPI HANA system. The difference might be what one can hear between a CD quality and a high-res digital music track. Unlike my own turntable system, I had not optimized the VTA or azimuth of this dual turntable. It has no VTA or azimuth adjustments that I could set. I set the tracking force to 1.75 grams and added some anti-skating force using a dial at the base of the tone arm. Instead of my VPI 10.5 inch long unipivot tone arm, the dual uses gimbal pivots on an 8.5 inch tone arm. The carbon fiber cartridge head shell is removable to easily accommodate other cartridges mounted on their own head shells. From internet sources, it appears this turntable, actually the CS503 2 model, was made in the mid-1980s and priced at around US $350. The website dual-reference.com states, its excellent test results alone are sufficient to place this turntable in the top class of audiophile turntables. Even though this turntable is labeled audiophile concept, Dual was mainly recognized for its well-made mass-market automatic record changer turntables. Unlike other Duals that use an idler wheel drive system, this model uses a belt to turn a plastic subplatter. A full-size 12-inch metal platter sits on top of the subplatter, similar in design to Rega turntables. The subplatter, motor, and tone arm are mounted on a metal deck which is fastened to three columns molded into the plastic base using three long bolts. This deck is isolated from the plinth, which appears to be made from a resin material and finished in a black fake wood finish. The turntable uses a TACO controlled DC motor, and while the 33 and 45 RPM selector does move mechanical levers, the speed of the motor shaft changes the speed of the platter, unlike mechanical systems which move the belt to a different diameter spindle on the drive shaft. This is a semi-automatic turntable. It powers on by lifting the tone arm and moving it to the start position. At the end of a record, it automatically lifts the tone arm and turns itself off. There is a damped cueing lever that helps to accurately lower the tone arm onto a desired track. The Ortofon OMB20 cartridge, equipped with an elliptical stylus that came with this turntable, are highly regarded on audio forums. Some suggest it rivals the Ortofon 2M Blue cartridge. New OM20 stylus can still be purchased. At a price of over $200, the stylus alone costs more than this vintage unit. Since speed is controlled electronically, I visually inspected the electrical components and wiring. I did not find any broken contacts or swollen capacitors that might affect the speed. 
I decided to clean the speed control contacts and any other electrical contacts accessible from the top with the main platter removed. I used spray and liquid contact cleaners to remove dirt and oxidization. Then I apply a coating of deoxid gold solution which claims to enhance, condition and seal gold-plated electronic connections. At the very least, the coating should help retard oxidation that occurs naturally when metal is exposed to air. The first contact I cleaned was the speed selector switch. To access the contact, I had to lift the plastic cover using a hex key to remove the five bolts. The second contact I cleaned was the start-stop switch contacts. Next, I removed the four-pin connector from its base on the electronics board at the rear by releasing the clip at the rear of the connector. This exposes the four pins to be cleaned. Next, I cleaned the four-pin connector on the tone arm where it attaches to the head shell. Lastly, I cleaned the RCA plugs and ground wire that go to the phono preamplifier. Judging from the number of posts on the topic of speed adjustment on audio forums, this seems to be a common problem with this model. One post suggested speed trim adjustments were accessed from the bottom of the turntable. I found one hole with a silver bolt poking through, but this turned out to be one of the bolts holding down the metal turntable deck to the base. There is a hex-shaped plastic trim pot located in a semicircular hole to the right of the motor, accessible from the top. Turning the pot counterclockwise using a 2 mm hex key increases the speed. Turning the pot clockwise decreases the speed. It is possible to set turntable speed using a stroboscope mat. Printable paper versions are available for free download such as this one from www soundsclassic.com. Perhaps because of my light source or my eyesight, I was not able to see the 33 RPM dots stand still. Instead I used a test record with a 1000 Hz tone and measured the frequency from my loudspeaker using my smartphone and a Spectrum Analyzer app. The one I use is called Spectroid. Left channel, standard recording level, velocity 5 centimeters per second, frequency 1000 cycles per second, left channel. Right channel, standard recording level, velocity 5 centimeters per second, Frequency 1000 cycles per second, right channel. Using this method, I adjusted the speed to between 1002 and 1008 Hz. I assume the variation between these two frequencies is due to the wow and flutter of the turntable. Its wow and flutter specification is 0.035% weighted RMS, which I believe is pretty good even by today's standards. Rumble is specified at below 70 dB. My audio system did not reveal any recurring low frequencies while playing a record. In summary, it amazes me how this 1980s lightweight turntable competes sonically with my 2012 60 pound built like a tank turntable and how a tiny moving magnet cartridge competes with a modern moving coil cartridge. Time will tell if the speed of this turntable will drift. In the meantime I will continue to enjoy its dynamic and highly engaging sonic presentation.